Okay, so this week we're gonna jump into stress and strain. So the exact same things we talked about last week, but now applied to bending. Now, the important thing to remember is that the basic principles remain the same. And just gonna have it handy here is the, the, the wonderful foam block. So some of this lecture is um, not something you have to repeat on your own, but I need to walk you through the process so that you understand where these ideas are coming from and how they got developed. So it's a fundamental understanding that is required to be shown to you because it's a very important because it helps you remember where the things came from. So there's a few takeaways that we're gonna be discovering in the next little while. And in that is some um, um, things that you're just, you should just know throughout your whole career. So we're gonna to start today with a quick recap um, because I'm going to do, um, derivation isn't the right word, but yeah, no, kind of. It's not your classic kind of integrating process. Um, and differentials, but we're going to derive an equation um, for stress in a beam. Now, it's a very particular shape of beam, um, and that's not the thing you're going to have to be able to do, but I want you to see where it comes from. We're going to do it twice in two different specific circumstances. But to do that, I want to give you a few refreshers about things. We're going to recap our stresses and strains in axial, and then we're going to remind ourselves about um, essentially analogous point loads. What did that mean when we uh, took a stress profile on something? We did it last term when we were talking about a loading profile and where that gets placed on an object because that's gonna be important within what we're doing right now. <clears throat> After that, we're gonna jump into beam theory. And so this is kind of this Bernoulli hypothesis is super important for you guys. I'm gonna work out stress in a beam for you guys. And then we're gonna jump into some examples. Um, we'll see how much time we have for me to be able to do uh, a video of as many of the examples as possible. So we'll get through as many as we can, but there's several of them embedded within the lecture for you as worked out examples. Also, I can tell you that there are a ton of these on the internet. Not that I'm suggesting you need to go do them. Doing all of the ones in this course should get you through everything you need to do. But for some people, I know you prefer to have a few more examples that you can work through. And for that, feel free to kind of Google beam bending, steel beam examples, things like that. And well, next week we'll specifically be doing steel beams, but you could search, um, be, uh, rectangular shape bending sort of thing. Okay, so let's jump into our refresher. Sorry, I'm, I get hot and cold here down here in the morning because the, the heat was down for the night and now it's come back on and so it gets really hot and then it gets really cold again. It's like five in the morning, so. The kids are hopefully going to stay asleep. It doesn't look like it's a snow day today. I'd be surprised if it is. I might have to stop the lecture. Yesterday was our five-year-old's first day back at school. Um, and our three-year-old, there's still more cases at daycare. And I just can't hand them over to somebody that probably has COVID. So uh, he's out for at least the remainder of this week. Okay, last week... We talked about stress. We kind of had our head around stress from last year when we were talking about um, uh, like foundations and things like that. But stress was force divided by area. So stress, all of our elements in this are in newtons and millimeters. So that works out to millimeters squared for area. But we keep our units in newtons and millimeters uh, for stress. Strain was a unitless measurement. I usually found it handy to remind myself uh, it was millimeters divided by millimeters, specifically because that helps me remember that my stress is uh, in newtons and millimeters, not kilonewtons and meters. So strain 
was our change in length divided by our length. Okay, then we thought, saw that there was a relationship between our stress and our strain, and that was the modulus of elasticity. And that could be represented as the slope of the line on our stress strain curve in our linear elastic zone. So stress, stress, strain, stress strain is the slope of this line, or stress divided by strain. With that relationship, we know that we can figure out the modulus of elasticity of most kind of normal materials that we would build things out of. We can also then test and see what stress those materials fa fail at. And we could take the relationships of all of those and write them out however we possibly need to. So remember, this is all just the same three equations combined and written slightly differently, but they're all the exact same equation. This is all the same equation, just written in different formats. Okay, so here's some refreshers uh, just to help remind you where I'm coming from when I do the example I'm gonna work out for you or the derivation of the equation that I'm gonna do for you. And so this is about just reminding you stuff we've talked about in the past. So the neutral axis is the object which, uh, the, is the, uh, the axis about which an object will rotate if spinning freely or the median line. The mean axis of mass, gravity, and inertia. Centroid, the mean position of matter in a body, the center of mass, center of rigidity, or center of inertia, the point about which a body will rotate if spinning freely. The intersection of neutral axes or median lines. Okay, in a beam that looks like this, when it's bending like this, this is our neutral axis. If we wanted to look at it, it's actually a bit of a pain that I don't have that wrapped around the front. I wonder if I could do it without, I wonder if I could do it here while I'm talking to you guys. Um, and that's gonna be important, understanding why in this particular example, we wanna talk about our neutral axis here. Okay. Equivalent couples. So we remember that when a force is applied concentrically to a body, it will move or translate in line with the applied force. So if we apply a load through this centroid, it will make it slide. All right, let me draw this line here. just give it to us on the other side, which might be handy for us. Okay, so we've got neutral axis, neutral axis. <clears throat> All right, so apply the load through the centroid, it slides or translates. When a moment is applied about the centroid of an object, it will rotate. And these are things that I think intuitively you understand. You push something in line, it'll slide. If you, put, if you rotate something, it will spin. You put a moment on it, it'll spin. If you take a force and apply it eccentric from its centroid, it will both slide and spin. So if just a moment causes it to spin and a force a causes it to slide, we know that if the force eccentric causes it to spin and slide, it's the same thing as the force through the centroid and the moment about the centroid. So a force eccentric is the same thing as a moment and a force through the centroid. We did some examples. So we saw that these two things were equivalent to each other. And we did some examples. This is one straight out of um, uh, last term where we looked at a force, eccentric. So this is 
uh, kind of the spot where it's rigid, it's being held stiff here, and all of this can kind of move. So we're considering this to be the centroid, which seems weird, I know, but it's so stiff there that it's actually acting like the centroid. We've got a force and we've got an eccentricity. That can give us a moment. This, this force, two meters from this point is the same thing as the force at this point and a moment about that point. So these two things are equivalent. What about the unit element? So that was last term and we were talking about overall objects. But we know that this term, or at least right now when we're talking about stress and strain, um, he said he'd give me a coffee in a minute. Um, when we're talking about stress and strain, we know we're talking about a little tiny little unit of element within the overall object. So how would that apply to the unit element? Well, a force eccentric from the centroid is the same thing as the force through the centroid and a moment. Let's take a look at this. What happens though if that load isn't evenly applied? And we talked about this last term when we looked at load distributions on a beam. And we talked about this thing called an analogous point load. Uh, we knew that it wasn't an exact representation, but in a given circumstance, if we looked at that particular free body diagram, we could use it to help us solve some problems. Change the dimensions or change anything, and it didn't quite apply anymore, and we would have to redo it. But we could redo it and have the same thing. Like, thank you. Um, so let's take a look what that means. I think you understand that if this is our object and we have this stress on it, it's the same and it's even everywhere. It's the same thing as one force right in the middle. And we talked about this really with our stress and strain last week. If we put one foot right here across the whole top of this, and it's the same thing as one point load right in the middle. It was kind of funny last week because one of the examples I used was a shoe. And we knew that there was something funny there about the shoe, that it wasn't really evenly distributed with a high heel. There was a moment where you could have all of your weight just on the heel of your shoe. And so I told you explicitly when you stand like this or you stand like this to use for your examples. So we know that these two things are equivalent. This is the stress smeared over the object and it's the equivalent as the force in one spot right here. And we would have taken this stress and multiplied it by this area. So when we're talking about the unit element, we tend to draw it as a cube. It doesn't have to be a cube, but that tends to be what, we, what we're talking about. If I call this side A and this side B and this side C, we have a stress over this object and we know it's the same thing as this force on this object because we have an area of A times B here. But drawing things in 3D is a pain in the butt. I'm not good at it. We tend to like to draw things in two dimensions. So this is C and this is A, but we understand that B goes into the page. There's another dimension we're not seeing here. So this stress is acting over an area of A times B. Even though we can't see B, we know it's there. And so often if we're drawing something that we all understand and we're all talking about, we might stop drawing B. We have to remember that it's there. If it's something that's important and you can't determine it, it's something I'd give you. But this is gonna be handy in a few minutes when we derive the equation that I'm talking about. So I just want you to remember that dimension B is there in the page. So really what we're saying is, um, if we were looking at the face of this object, I might draw it as if it was cut right here, but we know that this dimension is there when we look at it on a side profile. And so we'll often draw it like this, but we know that this dimension is still here. Okay, so 
We know that these are equivalent. It's the same thing as the last slide. Just B is missing in the drawing, but we know it's there. Okay. What if we don't have a uniform distribution on our object? We know that we can use an analogous point load to represent it still. So we have a stress distribution here, and there's the center of the stress distribution. Here's our object, and there's its centroid. Well, what happens if we vary the centroid? We have an eccentricity now. So this stress was perfect. It's right in the middle of our object, but the centroid of our object wasn't in the center of it. So, um, so maybe there was like a heavy mass here. This is why in the bean example that I did, it was moment connected to something stiff. Basically, it was so stiff it couldn't move there, but the rest of it could. It might only be a small amount it could move, but it made the centroid at the very end of it. And so this can still give us an eccentric or a moment. What happens if we vary the stress? Well, we know that in a triangular distribution, it's the area under this curve, um, and that it's at the two-third, one-third mark in the triangle. So we'd have an eccentricity. You could do it where we have a triangular distribution on an object with a centroid that's not in the middle of the object. So we'd have even more moment in that example. So different stress profiles can have different analogous point loads. All of these three have their centroid right in the middle of the stress profile. So the eight all have their analogous point load directly in the center. All of these have their centroid somewhere right here. This one's easy. It's at the halfway mark in this space. This one's at the halfway mark in this space. This one's the whole length, but it's gonna be at the two-third, one-third mark. So these three all have the same force. These three all have the same analogous point load. So internal stresses. We can approximate any distribution of stress across a system with an axial force and a moment that produces the same effect on the system. So we can take that concept of analogous point loads and apply it to our little blob of object if we wanted to. So if we have a triangular stress distribution, understanding that B is into the page, we know that there's a dimension we're not seeing there. It is uh, the same as this force so we can rewrite it as this force offset from the centroid. And we know that that force offset from the centroid can be rewritten as a force through the centroid with a corresponding moment. And that moment equals P times E. <coughs> okay, so this is where it gets fun. All right. Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. And this in the next slide, in the next three slides, are going to be some things that I want you to know. Uh, we're going to derive this for a rectangle, so very simple profile, um, but it's all based on three fundamental steps in thinking. Okay, so sometimes you call this the engineer's beam theory or classic beam theory. Obviously, everything is always more complicated than what we're saying, but this is a simplification um, of a process. So both da Vinci and Galileo tried to create beam theory, but they had, a, they had the problem that calculus didn't exist yet, um, and Hooke's law for springs, so that's, that's another thing. Um, we're not gonna go that in depth in it because really they would have done calculus to solve this. We are going to use some of our simple approximations, but we know that some of these simple approximations that we just get were really based on calculus. Um, so that whole area under a curve being approximated as a point load, we know that technically that actually comes from calculus. Some of it you intuitively understand, but it's tied directly to calculus. Even if you didn't do calculus, I can tell you that that's where those things come from. So it's based on ideas from Jacob Bernoulli. It was created in 1750 by uh, Leonhard, Le Lenhard, 
Euler, and Daniel Bernoulli. So the Bernoulli family were polymaths of an exceptional sort. You know, they were involved in accounting, they were involved in um, fluid dynamics, they were involved in calculus, they were involved in structural engineering before they even knew what they were trying to apply it to. So they were involved in all of kind of the the, the major sciences at the time. They, they all probably dabbled in alchemy as well. Um, but uh, they developed it and everyone was like, okay, that's great, lovely, but no one's gonna use math to do something. We don't trust math to design buildings. We're just gonna build it the way we know how to build it um, because we're pretty sure that's better than relying on this newfangled math process to figure it out. So uh, it was really just there as kind of an idea until um, the Eiffel Tower and the Ferris wheel design were designed in the 1890s. And those were trying to prove that this concept should be widely used because you could do something amazing. It's not that we couldn't build buildings before, but they had to be on the conservative side. Um, otherwise you risked collapse because you couldn't prove to someone that it worked. And that's really what my job is. I have to be able to have a whole set of documentations that I don't necessarily share with anyone, but I know that if anyone needed them, I could go, here you go. I proved that this thing works. Um, and my stamp, people then trust my stamp when I stamp a set of drawings that I've done all of that work. They're not like, show us all the calculations every single time, but you've put your stamp on it. We're trusting that you've done those calculations and maybe give us a few small calculations. And often the building department will ask to see a few small sample calculations of things. <clears throat> okay, here is the step one in the Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Plain sections remain plain. Okay, what the heck does that mean? Okay, here is, here is our wonderful object. We know that I've drawn a nice grid here. It's the fisheye lens <laughs> makes this very annoying. Uh, these are straight lines. This is a 90 degree angle. All right. When I bend this object, we know that at the top it squashes and at the bottom it stretches. But look at the pink line. It's moved, it's curved, but what's interesting, oh, you're amazing, thank you. At any given point here, right at that very tiniest of intersections, that is still a 90 degree angle. So this section, remain plain to this section. So if I look at this very center one, look at that, that one actually, it's hard to get it with the fisheye lens, look at that. That remained plain, okay? So that's step one. Any section you cut, that has remained plain. Okay, so for beam-like elements, trans transverse cross-sections perpendicular to the neutral axis remain plain and perpendicular to the neutral axis. Plain sections remain plain. So that line stays at a 90 degree angle to that neutral axis. Okay, to remain plain or straight, and those of you that um, remember that a straight line really can be represented as something linear. Sorry, I haven't eaten. I'll try to eat lightly during this. Okay. Those that remember that a straight line is a linear relationship. Remember our stress strain was a linear relationship. Okay, so if that's remaining plain, that means the relationship to how much this is squashed here and this is stressed, stretched here is a linear relationship. So remember, strain is about how much it's moved. So if this is its original shape, and then we deform it, that is our strain there. Okay, so we can calculate that strain. We can measure how much it moved, and we know where it was originally, and we can determine what our strain is. 
And if we calculate our strain here and our strain here and our strain here and our strain here and our strain here, we would find that that is linear. So imagine this is Dave in the winter, this is Dave in the fall, and this is Dave in the summer when his swim trunks fit perfectly. So this strain was a linear change. All right, what's the relationship between stress and strain? That's also a linear relationship. So if you have a linear relationship tied to another linear relationship, then that means it must also be linear. So if the strain is linear here, as you get farther away from the neutral axis, so remember this is our neutral axis, the stress must also be linear. So in normal ranges, we know stress and strain are proportional. That's our modulus of elasticity. That means linear. Therefore, stress must also vary linearly with its distance from the neutral axis. So if there's no stress here at the middle, because look at this, there's nothing happening. If there's no movement, if there's no deformation, we can't have any, any stress, we can't have any strain, and as we get further away, the strain varies linearly, then our stress must also be varying linearly. So we could actually draw this. This is our stress profile. It's the most here at the top and at the bottom. We often call the top and the bottom are extreme fibers. So you'll hear me say extreme fibers a lot, and I'm really just talking about the top and the bottom. We can see that our stress has varied linearly along this profile, with zero being at the neutral axis. And that seems to hold true with this bending. <clears throat> we have a lot of deformation at the top and at the bottom, and as much as it's curved, there's no change in length of that pink line at the neutral axis. Okay, so I've just taken this and I've just redrawn it. Just, it's, it's hard to draw it, like if, if, I, if I was drawing this on my straight line object or imagine that I'm drawing this cut through one of these planes. If you want, you can pretend that this is a beam right here. There's a beam going on there and I am drawing a section through it right here. Imagine I'm cutting it right there and we're looking at it inside profile, but we know that there's a beam going into the page there because we've got beam here. There's a, a, a length B or a dimension B here that we're not seeing in our 2D representation. It's also hard to kind of draw if we're cutting this right here and kind of imagining one side's not there for a moment it's hard to draw it right over it. So I'm just gonna take this and draw it over here a little bit. All right, look at this. So this is our stress. Our, our maximum stress is at the top and bottom. All right, if we look at a rectangle in bending, just as it starts to yield at the extreme fibers, we have a stress profile that looks like this. All right, or up until we have yielding at the extreme fibers. What this is saying is, yeah, this is a linear stress profile, um, but we don't care about that linear stress profile everywhere that we're in the elastic range because we know it works. What we want to know or what we care about is right at the moment this stops working because remember, we want our factored loads to be less than our reduced capacity. So what we care about is that reduced capacity or that maximum limit on this. We know that we have a stress from our stress strain curves that had a maximum limit that we had in our linear elastic zone. So if that's all we really care about, this could be any stress in the linear elastic range, but what we care about is the maximum stress in the linear elastic range. So we wanna limit this to the maximum stress we can possibly see in our elastic range. So we could call this stress max if we wanted. Okay. I'm gonna go through the process now for you. This is not a derivation you need to have memorized, but it is important that I share it with you. Okay, I'm gonna stop and eat a few bites of my breakfast. Okay, so what we have here 
is we're going to start to look at what happens internally in this beam in bending. All right. We know there was an internal moment on it. We did that with method of sections. But we're going to go a little bit a little bit further here. So what we're really saying is we have some beam of some dimension. We don't know what that dimension is. That's kind of irrelevant. We don't care what the actual load is here. But we're talking about some beam that is stable that has some load distribution on it of some sort. And what we're looking at right now is a section through that beam. All right? And it's a beam in bending. And we're talking about elastic bending here. All right, so elastic, remember, means that we're on that, uh, we're, we're in that straight line in the, um, in the stress strain modulus. We want to be in the zone, whereas if we took off the load, it would go back to its original shape. But we care about that exact moment when any part of the inside of this object hits that maximum stress before it switches to plastic behavior. We want to know what's going on right at that cusp, just before the worst spot switches to elastic to plastic bending. Now, remember, the top and bottom of the object see the most stress. Remember, that's where it's squished the most and stretched the most. And stress and strain are linearly related, which means the maximum stress is at the top and the bottom. And there's a linear relationship between those things. And so we have some cross section that looks like this. So if this is one, this is, this is our section one here. All right, and we have an axis and an axis. This is the axis we care about. This is the top of our object and this is the bottom. This is dimension B and this is dimension D. All right, so what I'm gonna start doing is drawing this beam kind of from the side, but I'm cutting it right here. So I've got this beam and I'm imagining I've cut it right here. So there's some other bit of the beam back here and I've cut it and there's some other part that I've cut off right here. And what we're worried about is the top and bottom at max stress. So just as the top is at the maximum stress and just at the bottom is at the maximum stress is what we're talking about. I try to draw internal forces in blue. So what we're saying is this is in compression. Uh, drawn this over a little too uh, um, ignore that line there for a although that's a pain in the ass way to draw it um, I wish I hadn't done that um, I didn't like the way I drew that there because I've told you we're going to start drawing it like this. All right, so I've just shifted that over. So these are our stresses. If it's going away, it's intention. If it's going towards it, it's compression. And this is what we care about is the maximum stress that we want to see or that stress just before it switches into plastic behavior. Anything below that, that's fine. That's good. No problem. But what we don't want is it to go beyond that point. So that's why we're going to focus on that. Okay. <clears throat> Normally I draw these kind of in line with each other. Um, we can redraw these. So look at this. This is a triangle and this is a triangle. We can draw this as an arrow at its distribution or stress distribution centroid. 
and we can draw this one as at its stress distribution centroid. So let's do that. Okay, remember there's a dimension B back here. So I'm going to redraw this as an arrow, as a force, a compressive force, and a tension force. So this is PC, and this is PT, and these are the eccentricities. E, C, and E, T. Remember, this is dimension D, so this is one half D, and this is one half D. So if the whole thing was D, this is one half D, and this is one half D. So the centroid of this stress profile is two thirds up from one half D, and this is two-thirds down from one-half D. So we know what these dimensions are. We know that this is two-thirds of one-half D and two-thirds of one-half D, right? We know we also like to tend to draw this as its equivalent moments. So let's take a look and see what we get when we do that. Well, we know that this has an eccentricity and this has an eccentricity. These could be the same as it acting through the neutral axes and a moment about the neutral axes. So let's draw PC and PT, and we know that then these would have a corresponding moment. This is where our pin is. PC caused it to spin in that direction, or the positive direction. PT also caused it to spin in that direction, or the positive direction. So it looks like these will cancel out, but the moments increase. The moments are both going in the same direction. So this is MC and this is MT. All right, <clears throat> I'm just going to draw this because some people tend to get a little bit confused here. We want to figure out what the value of these area, arrow, arrows are, right? That stress distribution that we were talking about is actually in three dimensions. So we've been looking at this face of the triangle, but really, don't forget about this dimension B that's been hidden in the back of the page. And this is our one half D. And this is our stress max. So PC, which is happening somewhere two thirds up and in the center here, is PC is the, the volume of this. So we have one half D times B times stress divided by two. Remember, because it's a triangle. If this was one big square, one big rectangle, it would be one half, one half D times B times the, the stress max. But we don't, we only have half of it because it's a triangle. All right, so we have our PC. This is a bit messy to write. Let's rewrite this a bit as stress B D divided by four. All right. And then we know that this is happening at two thirds up, and that was one half D. So EC is two thirds times one half D. 
So we have 2 times, so 2 times 1 is 2, 3 times 2 is 6. 2 sixths is the same as 1 third. So 1 third D. Okay, great. We know that then that means that P T also equals stress BD4 and ET equals one third D. So we have the value of all of these things, but we want to talk about these. We want to figure out what's happening here. So we can take this here and we can sum the forces in this direction and we can sum the moments. You could do it with this one too. It's the same thing. So let's look at summing the forces in the x direction where everything in this direction is positive. All right, so we're summing all of these forces and we have PC, we have PC is negative plus PT equals zero. So PC we solved for is minus BD divide, stress BD divided by four plus stress BD divided by four. Uh, these cancel each other out and zero equals zero. Great, so our object isn't sliding, which kind of makes sense or else we'd have something weird going on. But we do know that there should be internal moment in this. And we can see that there is of some sort. So let's sum our moments about our neutral axes here. We're, we're spinning about the z-axis, so my thumb coming out of the page. Everything in that direction is positive. All right, let's see what we get here. We know that there's probably some internal moment in here, and we want to know what that is. So we have some internal moment that we're trying to establish, um, and then we have these two applied moments. We want to find out what these equal. So MC plus MT equals some internal moment. And that's what we want to figure out right here. All right, so our total M equals MC, which MC, so it's spinning in that direction, it's positive. And we know that our MC is um, uh, our PC times our EC. So our PC is 1 half D times B times stress. Oh, sorry that our PC is stress BD divided by four times our EC, which is one, one third D, plus our MT, which is spinning in that direction, which is also stress BD divided by four times one third D. Okay, so that's looking kind of messy. Let's uh, rearrange this or start to sum th some things up here. This looks like stress BD squared divided by 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, and then we've got that again. All right, so we've got uh, stress BD squared divided by 12 plus stress BD squared divided by 12 so we have two of these so 2 divided by 12 is 1 sixth so m equals stress bd squared divided by 6. okay this was all about the fact that this shape was a rectangle remember this shape was based on the fact that we were cutting through this rectangular shape a different shape here would have a different looking stress profile or a different place where the centroid was really which means this would start to look very different but that means that this part right here shapes 
shape related. So this has, the only thing this has to do with is the shape of our object. So our internal moment here is M equals stress times some shape dependent value. Change the shape and this might change a little bit. So what we do is we say, okay, we don't, we want to write this equation where we could have this as a placeholder for any possible shape. We just want to get our head around that. So we actually call this something. We call this the section modulus. Okay. We like to get to call everything a modulus, but this is really just a shape profile. So really what our equation is, is M equals stress times our section modulus or our shape profile. So this S is a placeholder for our shape related set of value. Now we just derived this for a rectangle. We did it. It took one page. You could imagine that a lot of people have probably done it for almost all the shapes that we use. You could do it manually for any shape. We could go through and do this for an I-beam and I have done it for an I-beam. I've done it for lots of different shapes. But once we do it enough, do we have to do it again? Do I ever have to derive a rectangle again? This wasn't a specific load that I applied to this. We didn't even care what the load profile was up here. We just knew that what we cared about was this at its maximum stress. Well, that means that I should never have to derive this for a rectangle ever again. We're there. We did it. We solved it for a rectangle. Great. Done. So BD squared divided by six is the shape section modulus for a rectangle. Let's take a look here. So that's been <clears throat> worked through here. You can see it again in the slides. But then I have that uh, uh, worked through uh, as a graphic in the slide as well. Okay. So just as our steel starts to yield at the extreme fibers, remember extreme fibers just means top and bottom, we can figure out a relationship between stress and moment. So for a rectangle in elastic bending, moment equals stress times BD squared divided by six. But BD squared divided by six was only about the shape. If we use a placeholder S or our section modulus so that we have an equation for any shape, we end up with M equals stress times our section modulus. So this is elastic bending of any shape where S is dependent on the profile. So I've got a little typo there. That should be any. I'm going to remind myself to fix that. Okay. Let's do an example here. <clears throat> if the stress capacity in a 450 deep by 200 wide beam is 200 MPa, what is the moment at the extreme fibers just as it reaches its elastic limit? Or what could the moment be just as it reaches its elastic limit? Remember, what we care about is the maximum value it could see. So this is saying it could see up to 20 MPa. We know now that we can convert that into an actual moment. So if we've been given 20 MPa, we know the shape is 200 by 450, and we know that moment is stress times our section modulus. They've told us that this is a rectangle. It's 450 deep by 200 wide. So our section modulus is BD squared divided by six. 20 times 200 by 450 squared divided by six is uh, 135 million Newton millimeters. This is why we turn it back into kilonewton meters at this point, because it's a pain in the butt to work with numbers this large. So we divide it by a thousand to switch millimeters to meters, and we divide it by a thousand to switch uh, newtons into kilonewtons, and we have 135 kilonewton meters. So the maximum moment we would want this beam to see would be 135 kilonewton meters. 
If we went over 135, we'd go over this stress profile. And if we go over this stress, we've been told that this is the limit as it reaches at its extreme fibers and the elastic limit. So if we go over that, our member fails. If this was a brittle material, that's the end of it. If we go over this, the top of that beam fails. So if, if we look at it as, uh, as this right here, we've got the top and we've got the bottom. Uh, and we know that we don't want this to go over 20 MPA. We don't want this to go over 20 MPA. But if we go over 20 MPA, this fails. It's if it's a brittle, brittle material. That means that at 20 MPA, it can take 135 kilonewton meters. So if we go over 135 kilonewton meters, this would fail. Okay, this next step only applies for plastic materials. So concrete, nope, cannot do it. The last equation is all that we will ever use. Wood, nope, cannot do this next stage. It can only do the last equation. So this, pretty much what I'm about to tell you right now, only applies to steel. But it's important that you understand what it is. Okay, so in our last one, we said that we were hitting, okay, let me make myself bigger here, not just move me around. Okay. We were saying that we hit our maximum stress profile just as it started to yield. Right? So for uh, concrete, that's it. After this, we're done. It fails. If it goes over this, it cracks, and that's the end of it. Wood, it reaches that limit. It cracks. It fails. We're done with it. Steel, we know, is plastic. So if we hit that maximum stress right here and right here, we know that it's ductile. There may be some permanent deformation, but it doesn't completely fail yet. There's a little bit more it can do. So what if we went over that just a tiny little bit? Can't do it in concrete, can't do it in wood, but let's see what happens when we do it in steel. Okay, so we're gonna go past it a little bit, all right? We're gonna just let it yield a tiny little bit, okay? So yeah, this zone here has a little bit of permanent deformation, but it transfers from here down to here very, very quickly. So we're talking an almost insignificant amount of yielding because there's still a chunk of this that's in the elastic range. Okay, great. So all of this is at its maximum yielding stress. And we've still got some here that's in nothing. What if we take it just a tiny little bit farther? And we're saying like it's bare, we're barely doing anything. Like this to this last one I'm gonna draw happens with like just the tiniest little bit of increase. Okay, let's take it all the way down to the neutral axes. Remember, this only works in an element that can yield or has yielding. And we would only allow it to happen in materials that have a really predictable yielding behavior. So basically I'm telling you, steel. So we've pushed this so that there's a tiny little bit of yielding all the way down to the neutral axis. There would be some permanent deformation, but look, we're stopping just as we get to the neutral axis. So there's, the neutral axis has no yielding. We are still technically good. We have a little bit, like a tiny little line of our object that hasn't gone over into the yielding side of our uh, of our stress strain profile. Let's see what happens in this 
um, for an object that goes into plastic bending. So we have our neutral axes and we have our object here. And we are allowing it to go into plastic bending only just like just at, like if you want you could even imagine that this is like a fraction of a millimeter away from the neutral axis I find that sometimes people find help find helpful so this is side is in compression and this side is in tension so we know that we could redraw this And just to remind ourselves, I always find this helpful. This is one half D and this is one half D. We know there's a dimension B into the page. We know that we can redraw this compressive block as a single arrow through the stress profile centroid. Remember the last one was a triangle. So it was two thirds up from the neutral axes. And this one was two thirds down from the neutral axis. But these are rectangular stress profiles. So they're gonna be right in the middle of it. It's centroid also is in the middle. Oh, sorry, we'll call this PC and we'll call this PT. And we know that this is EC and this is ET. Let's, let's redraw it again even. Okay, so we've got this. Let's redraw this as, um, uh, instead of a force with an eccentricity, let's draw it as a force through the centroid with a moment. All right, we've got PC and PT, and we've got MC and MT. They're both in the positive direction. All right. Last time, the triangle, we knew that there was something going into the page here. We can do the same thing. This is our compressive stress block. We know that this is dimension B. This, this is our stress. And this is one half D. And we want to draw this as the equivalent kind of arrow right in the center of this. So PC equals stress times B times one half D or uh, stress B D divided by two, and EC equals one half times one half D, or D divided by four. Let's figure out what the total moment on this is. So our total moment equals MC plus MT. They're both going in the positive direction. MC is PC times EC and uh, sorry, MT is PT times ET. Well, we know what all of these values are. So this equals stress BD divided by two times D divided by four plus stress BD divided by 2 times D divided by 4. So M equals, we've got stress BD squared divided by 8, and we've got two of those. So 2 divided by 8 is the same as 1 quarter. So M equals stress BD squared divided by 4. 
Well, this looks very similar to our last one. What if we did the exact same thing? This is a shape property. It's shape dependent. Okay. So this is shape dependent. Okay, so we could say that this is a different shape property that we give it. This was very explicitly plastic bending. So plastic bending, not to be confused with our elastic bending. Remember, concrete can't do this. Wood can't do this. Steel can. So what we say for plastic bending, M equals stress times Z. So Z is our plastic stress modulus, or, or our, sorry, shape modulus. Okay, so plastic bending, we'll use Z. Elastic bending, we'll use S. And remember, this is yielding all the way down to the neutral axis, so you can only do this with a material that has plastic behavior. And even then, you might say, I don't trust this. I'm going to use the elastic bending uh, profile method because I know I can depend on this. So this isn't something we would always do. It would be in specific times where we know we have materials that can have safe yielding uh, characteristics. Okay, so let's see what's next in the slides here. Okay, so if we allowed the steel to yield over the full depth, we figure out another relationship between stress and moment. M equals stress times BD squared divided by four for plastic bending of a rectangle. Remember, this shape property Z is only for a rectangle. We could do it for other shapes if we wanted to. So why don't we just use a, pl a placeholder Z for our plastic section modulus so that we have an equation for any shape. M equals stress times Z. Now, just to completely mess with you, anybody using the British codes, they call the elastic modulus Z and the plastic modulus S. Just to completely, absolutely screw everybody up, we have different codes from each other or different terminologies for things. So don't worry about that. We're going to use S for elastic and Z for plastic, okay? What about that same problem before? If the stress capacity in a 450 by 200 wide beam is 20 MPa, what is the moment at the extreme fibers when it reaches its plastic limit? Now remember, the other one could have been concrete, could have been wood, it could have been steel we would allow it to have 135 kilonewton meters on it. If it is a material like steel, we might let it yield just the tiniest little bit until the neutral axis is just at its elastic limit. So for that, it's stress times BD squared divided by four for a rectangle, or 20 times 200 by 450 squared divided by four, or uh, uh, 202 million 500,000 kilo or newton millimeters. Remember, we're always going to switch that back into kilonewton meters or 202.5 kilonewton meters. So if we have an element that we might allow to yield just the tiniest little bit, so just like the tiniest little amount of permanent deformation, we could say that beam could safely carry 202.5 kilonewton meters. If it was concrete or wood, it would fail. It couldn't do it. If it was concrete or wood and 20 MPa was its limit, maybe it could take um, uh, 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 135 kilonewton meters. Now remember, this is a material that's 20 MPa as its limit. We know that that's bullshit for steel. That's not the limit for steel. So I was just trying to use that as a description. This is some unknown material, um, but we don't know if it's brittle or plastic. If we find out it's brittle, the last equation would work. If it fi we find out it has plastic behavior that we can depend on, we might allow it to, we might say, okay, it could safely carry this amount of moment. All right. 
Um, I just want to flip ahead just a tiny little bit and see. Okay, I'm going to come back to me here for just a few minutes. Uh, I think maybe I just heard a kid wake up. I'm not sure. What time is it? Oh, they need to sleep longer. Oh, I need to turn this. Okay. So that's what we talk about with, um, I don't think it was, uh, that was for bending. That was for our strength profile. What else can we figure out from this Euler Bernoulli theory that plane sections remain plane, which means our strain varies linearly at the, from the extreme fibers to the extreme fibers, which means stress varies linearly from the extreme fiber to the extreme fiber. Well, remember how stress, axial stress and strain were very similar to shear stress and strain? We could derive a few more things. Way beyond this class, I just want you to understand where some of these things come from because we'll use them. So if we went through some crazy process and knowing that shear stress and strain are related to uh, axial stress and strain, we could go through a process where we could come up with another weird shape property. It's called I, or moment of inertia. For a rectangle, it's BD cubed divided by 12. Now, literally, I have done this. I have done it for very complicated shapes. You guys don't have to do that. I'm going to give you charts that show most of these values. Okay, but I is now another weird shape property. It's dependent on the shape. Look, B and D are the only values in this. Where did it come from? Again, this is not something you're gonna have to do, uh, but uh, that is a kid. Uh, for, for a uniformly distributed line load on a simply supported beam, we could have our angular strain here. Don't worry about it. It goes through a process of angular strain where we integrate and find rotation at any point, and then we integrate again and we can get deflection. For a uniformly distributed line load on a simply supported beam, we can go through this process and our deflection is five times WL to the power of four. W is our load, L is our length of our beam. <coughs> 384 is a, con a constant. E is the um, modulus of elasticity of our material and I is a shape property. It is BD cubed divided by 12 for a rectangle. But this starts to mean that we can actually figure out actual deflection of members. And next week, we're going to use this pretty intensely. I didn't make you derive it. I'm gonna tell you though, that it went through a very similar process to what we did for finding our moment um, for plastic and elastic behavior. Okay, so what's the big takeaway? Deformation and strength are related for each material, and we have data on most materials when they're in a normal range of behavior. There are section properties that allow us to calculate strength and deformations of shapes. Combine our knowledge of the shape and the material, and we can design members to a certain strength and deformation. So if we have an upper bound on the stress and an upper bound on the deformation, maybe say, uh, uh, serviceability limits. So we have an upper bound on our strength because we know our material just fails at a greater load than that or a greater stress than that. And we have an upper limit on our deformation, which is our sizing, or our, sorry, our serviceability limits. Well, then we should be able to s figure out the, the, um, the, there's a massive bug in our home. Oh, it's, no, it's just the light doing weird things and it's a ladybug. <laughs> It's early, I'm tired, I apologize. Um, and I'm out of coffee. But with the material knowledge we have and the shape knowledge that we have, I mean, a rectangle's super easy. BD squared divided by six, BD squared divided by uh, four, or uh, BD cubed divided by 12. Those are just three. Oh, we have another one, area, B times D. We have all kinds of shape properties that we could proper, possibly use about that particular shape. 
for a rectangle. We know that we've derived it. Well, we kind of cheated on the, uh, the, the eye or the moment of inertia. But we can do it for any shape. And we know all kinds of stuff about materials. You will find on Quercus a section properties uh, chart. Look at this. Rectangle. Axis of moment through center. So there's our neutral axes. A. B times D. That one's easy. We kind of know. So there's B. There's D. Don't worry about C. I equals BD cubed divided by 12. S equals BD squared divided by 6. Z equals BD squared divided by 4. Huh. R. Meh. We're not going to worry about R right now. I'm going to tell you it's another one we're going to use, but just in an equation, and it'll be something we'll always look up. So don't even worry about that. It kind of has to do with how far this point is from other things, but we're not going to worry about that right now. I just want you to know that we're going to use this weird value R, but it is, again, just a shape property. So those are the ones we just talked about. You can calculate it for an I-beam. Look, they're kind of messy. What if there was an even easier way to get the I-beams? What if we weren't just making up sections that we wanted to use? What if there was a uh, book of the normal material, of the normal shapes that we would possibly use? Like say, um, let me just flip to it here. We'll look at, look at this. Look at this right here. We've got a normal looking shape and a bunch of information. What if I gave you that too? What if I gave you the, so here's, here's all kinds of different shapes, but then here's one for our actual steel members that we use all the time. In this, there is I, there is S, there is Z. There's also that R value. So here are the different members that we can have in steel. We can get I, we can get S, and we can get Z. When we are bending these beams like this, we are bending it around a neutral axis that's right here. This, we always call everything in this direction an x-plane. So we're bending this about our x-axis. There's our x-axis. We're talking about shape properties about the x-axis. So I, X, S, X, and Z, X. What happens if I bent this in that direction instead? Well, that would be me bending it about a different neutral axis or about the Y axis. And that's going to be important. So I'm going to turn this now. So this is our X axis here, we've got an x-axis here in this, in this version of it. And when we bend it sideways, there's our y-axis, okay? If we had something in uh, bending and the top is in compression, we know that uh, compression likes to buckle. Look at that. It's almost like it's simultaneously trying to bend or do something in the weak axis. So maybe it's going to be important to understand what's the strong axes and what's the weak axes when we get into something in a couple weeks. So that'll be in two weeks we're going to start talking about that. Okay, let's do some examples. So this question says, a simply supported steel beam spans 4 meters. If the factored load on the beam is 7.8 kilonewtons per meter, and the reduced capacity of the steel is 0.9 times 300 MPa, what depth does it need to be if, if it is 13 millimeters wide and a rectangle? Check for elastic and plastic behavior. <coughs> okay. You guys don't want to see me that big. <clears throat> Let's come down here to this. Okay. All right, let me get set up here. I always like to start with everything I've been given. So we have 
x's. This is example one, I believe. All right, given. What knowledge do we have before we even start doing anything? Well, they told us the length was four meters. They told us that we had a factored load, a uniformly distributed line load of 7.8 kilonewtons per meter. Remember, this is stuff that we did last term. They told us that we have a maximum reduced stress that we're allowed to see on this. So they've told us there's a little r, and it is 0.9 times 300 MPa. Let's just figure out what that is now so we don't have to keep writing that in. Let's take this as 0.9 times 300, or 270 MPa. Okay, B equals 13 millimeters. So they told us it's a rectangle. And we want to know what depth we would allow this to be if it was if we only allowed elastic behavior. So how deep would it need to be to make sure we didn't go over this stress profile? And how deep would it need to be if we allowed it to go slightly into the plastic range? Okay. The very first thing we need to do is figure out what the loads are on it. So we need to figure out what the factored internal loads are. Okay, we know that we have a simply supported beam <clears throat> that has supports and an applied load. We know that this is 4 meters and we know that this is 7.8 kilonewtons per meter. Well, last term or last year, I made you do this by method of sections. We went through a whole process, but we derived some equations in that process. And I'm telling you that from this point on, you don't need to do method of sections you can use those equations that we derived together. And if you guys remember, for a simply supported beam with a, a uniformly distributed line load on it, M, we get to use the subscript F because we're talking about a subscript F load being applied to it. MF equals WL squared divided by eight. Or 7.8 times four meters squared divided by eight. We get to work in kilonewtons and meters here because all of these things are in kilonewtons and meters. We can switch it to newtons and millimeters. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You can do it at any point you'd like. Well, let's see what we get. 7.8 times four squared divided by eight equals 15.6 kilonewton meters. 15.6 kilonewton meters. <clears throat> Remember how much time we spent doing that last term and look how quickly we can do it now. Okay, but we had to know the process before we just jumped into being able to do it like this. Well, we know that we could also rewrite this as 15.6 times 10 to the 6 newton millimeters. All right, those are the same thing. Oh, this, I forgot my little 6 here. Uh, multiply it by a thousand to switch kilonewtons to newtons and multiply it by a thousand to switch meters to millimeters. Let's talk about elastic bending. Okay, for elastic bending, um, we know that M uh, max equals or M max would be our stress max times B D squared divided by six. If that's the maximum stress we can see, that's the, ma that's the maximum moment we would wanna see. Well, our maximum stress was based on our reduced stress capacity. 
with a maximum stress we would want our object to see, and then we've reduced it just to be on the safe side. So basically, MR equals our stress R times BD squared divided by six. We know, we know we want MF to be less than MR. If we designed it absolutely perfectly, MF would be equal to MR. Or imagine MF being 0 0.00000000 Newton millimeters less than MR, okay? So if MF equals MR, we could say that 15.6 equals our stress R, or let's maybe write this as MF, equals our stress R BD squared divided by six, or 15.6 times 10 to the six Newton millimeters equals 270 MPA times B, which is 13, times D squared divided by six. D is our only unknown, D, equals, we can rearrange all of this, and D is the uh, square root of 6 times 15.6 times 10 to the 6 divided by 270 divided by 13, or 163 millimeters. If we allow only elastic behavior to occur and we know that this is the maximum stress that our material can see, if we go over this we're no longer in the elastic range. If this is a brittle material, if we go over this we're going to assume that it fails. So to not fail this beam needs to be at least 163 millimeters deep to support this load. Okay? This is what we've been trying to do. We now know that for this object, this is what how deep it needs to be to resist this applied load. What if we allowed plastic behavior? <clears throat> Remember, this says that the whole thing isn't yielding, but we're letting it yield just down to the neutral axis. If it was a brittle material like concrete or wood, we would not allow this. So this can only happen for ductile materials. And in ductile materials, M equals stress BD squared divided by four. Okay, so if we have uh, our, if we have our M of uh, 15.6 times 10 to the six, equals 270 times 13 times d squared divided by 4. We can rearrange this and d we calculate gets, let's, let's actually do it. We've got our square root and we've got 4 times 15.6 times 10 to the power of 6 divided by 270 divided by 13 we get 133 millimeters. So if this is an object that we might allow plastic bending in, we could have a deeper beam. Remember, our goal is to always find the cheapest member that works. Cheapest doesn't mean uh, ugliest, but cheapest does usually mean the lightest. Which one's going to weigh less? a beam that's 13 millimeters by 163 or 13 millimeters by 133. Yeah, this one. So if it was a brittle material, we'd have no choice. We'd want to use this one. But if we could use elastic, we could save some material, which means our object would be cheaper and use this one. If we went smaller than this, what happens? Our object would fail because then we wouldn't be able to resist 270 MPA. And I think this is where I always want you to stop and check. If you're rounding anything and you're trying to decide, do I round up or do I round down? Well, stop and think. If I made my object smaller, would it still work? 
And the answer is no. I think intuitively you would understand that if you made the object smaller, it wouldn't work anymore. So we want to find the smallest possible object that works. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what, what I've got next here. Oh, another example. Let's take a look here. I can't remember how many examples I actually have. All right. Did quite a few examples. Okay. This is good though, I think for you guys. I've lost track of how long this lecture is, so hopefully I don't go over. So example two, what is the stress on a simply supported W310 by 39 beam that spans 5.6 meters and has a factored load of 27.5 kilonewtons per meter if the beam remains in the elastic zone? Or I should say must remain in the elastic zone. I'm gonna add that in into the wording on this. I'm going to add in the word must remain in the elastic zone there. Okay, so we have another kind of simple example. Um, and I can tell you that this is very similar to exactly what we do. Remember last year, we figured out how we would maybe lay things out. And we would know that 5.6 meters isn't a ridiculous span for this beam. Uh, we know that we figured out this factored load probably by uh, looking figuring out what all the loads on that floor were, factoring them and adding them up, um, and then looking at the tributary width on this beam to determine that 27.5 kilonewtons per meter is what's acting on this beam. As I've said many, many times in Structures 1 and Structures 2, they are a continuation of one course. So we do have to do all the stuff we did in Structures 1 and Structures 2. It is a linear process. We, we started the process in structures one and we're finishing the process in structures two. So it makes sense that we're still doing work from structures one. I had a complaint last year that it wasn't fair that I had structures two have any relation to structures one. That was the weirdest, well, not the weirdest, but one of the weirdest complaints I've gotten. Okay, let's work through this process. What were we given? We were given that the member is a W310 by 39. We were given a length of 5.6 meters. We were given a factored linear line load of 27.5 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, and they've told us that um, we have to keep this in the elastic range. Okay, well, hmm, seems like we're missing a few things here. Um, uh, <coughs> sorry. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my head around something here. Uh, we want to know if this stays in the elastic zone or not. Okay, so let's say, let's see if this actually does stay in the elastic zone. That's what we want to know. All right, so the very first thing we want to do is uh, look up some things about our member properly. Um, actually, no, let's find MF. MF equals what? Well, it's told us in the question that it's uh, it's a, a member of L with WF on it. So we know that we can figure out that MF equals WF L squared divided by 8 or uh, 27.5 
times 5.6 squared divided by 8. We have a moment of 107.8 kilonewton meters acting on this beam. Okay. Um, we need to know uh, uh, what the stress is on this. So we want to know what the stress is. I'm going to go back and look at how that question was worded because that wasn't how I got the wording of that question. Uh, what is the stress? Okay, yeah, so what is the stress on it? Um, and we're staying in the elastic zone. I had read it wrong the first time. So really what we're looking for is stress equals what? <clears throat> well, um, we know that moment equals stress times S in the elastic zone. So we're not using the plastic zone, we're using section modulus S. We know that for a rectangle, S is BD squared divided by 6. But this isn't a rectangle. This is a W section. And we didn't derive S for an I section. So let's take a look at, um, I'm going to open up I'm going to go to uh, my PDF of steel sections, and we're going to open that up. Steel sections. We could go to the one that is actually um, uh, um, we could calculate it. We could go to the one that lets us calculate it, or we could be lazy and just look I up directly. All right. Let's scroll in on this. So look, we've got our designations here. We've got I, Z, and S. Sorry, I, Z, and S. Uh, we've been told we have a W310 by 39. So that's not the right page. All right, W310. Oh, W310 by 39, right here. <clears throat> SX. W310 by 39, 549, uh, but look at this, it tells us that it's times 10 to the 3 millimeters cubed. So we don't want to forget that, that's important. Don't forget to look at this up here. Look at, look at I times 10 to the 6. Jiminy Cricket, look at CW times 10 to the 9. Well, that's going to come later, don't worry about that too much right now. So SX for a W310 by 39 is 549 times 10 to the 3 millimeters cubed. So let's uh, bring me back up to big. All right. So we now know <clears throat> what S for a W310 by 39 is, and they told us it was 549 times 10 to the 3 millimeters cubed. Okay, so we know uh, MF, and we know what S is. Stress is going to be M divided by S. Oh, look what we haven't done. This is in kilonewton meters. This is the same as 107.8 times 10 to the 6 newton millimeters. Multiply it by 1,000 to switch kilonewtons to newtons, and multiply it by 1,000 to switch meters to millimeters. We have 107.8 times 10 to the 6 divided by 549 times 10 to the 3. 107.8 times 10 to the 6 divided by 549 times 10 to the 3 equals 196.4 MPa. So the max, so the stress that this object sees under that loading is 196.4. 
That's saying that our steel beam has a stress profile of 196.4 and 196.4 MPA and MPA. We have an answered if it works or not because we don't know what the maximum stress that this object can see is. Do you guys remember last week when I said some information about regular materials? They didn't ask us if it worked. They just asked us what the stress profile was or what the maximum or what the actual stress on this object was. Well, we know it's 196.4, but we know this is a steel beam. And I told you last week that a steel object is usually 350 or 345 MPA. Well, this certainly looks less than those values. So we can probably assume that this beam works. It might actually even be over-designed. Maybe we could even use a smaller beam. But that wasn't what the question asked. I just want to start getting the wheels turning there for you. Okay, so this has been solved here for you. All right, so here's a little recap. Elastic stress is M equals stress times S. S is all about the shape. For just a rectangle, S equals BD squared divided by six. If we allow plastic stress, which is only on certain materials and only at certain times, it's M equals stress times Z. And Z is just a different shape property. We derived it for a rectangle. <coughs> Strain varies depending on the loading conditions of the beam but we're almost exclusively going to talk about a uniformly distributed load. Uh, and the, uh, the deflection it actually sees is uh, this equation here, but I is all about shape. This is about the material property, and the, this is about the load, and this is about the length of the beam. I is about shape, and we know for a rectangle, it's BD cubed divided by 12. Let's do another example. I like this example a lot. We have a simply supported beam uh, that's 10 meters long with a uniformly distributed line load of 50 kilonewtons per meter. We have a width of 50 millimeters and we want to know how deep this beam needs to be. They've told us that uh, the steel capacity is the reduction factor times Fy, so they've already done it for us, is 270 MPa. The steel has an E of 200,000 MPa. There's a maximum deflection limit of L divided by 360. We want to limit behavior to elastic behavior. So we're talking about S as our, uh, our, our shape property that we're going to use. So we want to know how deep this beam needs to be. Remember, we did one similar to this with axial loads last week. Okay. So let's do this example. Bending example. All right, they've given us a bunch of information. We've been given that WF is 50 kilonewtons per meter. We've been given that L <clears throat> is 10 meters. We've been given that B is 50 millimeters. We've been given that our, uh, our, our reduced stress capacity is 270. MPA. We've been told that E, which we already know, is 200,000 MPA. And we've been given that we have a maximum allowable deflection of L divided by 360. We know that we have a simply supported beam with a line load on it. 
I know I have this information right here, but I'm just going to write it again. That's 10 meters, and that is 50 kilonewtons per meter. And we need to figure out what D is. We want the shallowest beam possible that works. So it has to be big enough to work, but we don't want it to be bigger than it needs to be or else we're just wasting money. So why would we waste money? Uh, I think this gets slightly better. Uh, no, it gets a little bit fuzzy again. Wish I knew how to make it focus better. That'd be a little bit better. Okay. So um, let's start with bending. Let's look at bending. Or let's, yeah, let's talk about um, stress for bending. All right, stress, remember, is strength or force. We're talking about um, uh, life safety here. We have our moment is WL squared divided by 8, or MF, is 50 times 10 squared divided by 8. 50 times 10 squared divided by 8 equals 625 kilonewton meters which we know is the same as 625 times 10 to the 6 newton millimeters. Okay, so we've got the maximum moment that this object sees, and we want to make sure it works. <clears throat> M equals stress divided by the oh, yeah, oh, buddy, I love you. Can I finish doing this? Can I finish doing this? Do you want to say hi to everyone? Do you want them to see you? Donkey, look up here. Uh-oh, Mommy just broke. <laughs> come here. Do you want to sit in my lap while I do this then? Right, come here. All right. Do you want to say hi to everyone? Who's that handsome guy? You want to sit in my lap while I do this? Yes, that is... Ah, oh, you can rarely ever see it. But that line outside my window is Lake Ontario. You can see Lake Ontario out there. That's what happens when you live in the middle of nowhere. You can have water. You can have property near the water. Okay, let me flip this back down. Okay, so we figured out our load on our object. We know the max internal moment, 625 times 10 to the 6 Newton millimeters. <coughs> oh, bless you. Okay, we know that um, uh, our stress is our reduced uh, load here. We know that S is a shape property that is BD squared divided by six for a rectangle, which we have. Um, <clears throat> so maybe we can start to solve this. We have 625 times 10 to the six equals 270 MPA times B, which is 50, times D, which is our unknown, divided by six. So we I can- I like a knight and a claw. We have, well, what we have to do is we have to rearrange this now. And so D is going to equal the square root of 6 times 625 times 10 to the 6 divided by 270 times 50. <clears throat> okay, we've got this rearranged. Let's plug it into our calculator. We've got the square root of 6 times 625 times 10 to the 6 divided by 270 divided by 50. And we get 527 millimeters. 
So to make sure that this object works for strength, it needs to be 527 millimeters deeply, okay? So why don't you go back in the other room? <clears throat> All right, so that's what it needs to be for strength. What about for strain or deformation? So this is still for bending. Let's go through this example. Now, from the beam loading diagrams, we could see that most of them last term had a deflection uh, uh, equation tied in with them. I've shown you the one here is for a uniformly distributed line load on a simply supported beam, delta equals 5WL4 five five WL divided by 384 E. This is something I plug into my calendar or my calculator again and again and again and again. So if this is the actual deflection and we want to limit the deflection to this, well, maybe we have some stuff we can work with. We want to limit our deflection to, we want to limit our actual deflection to our deflection limit. W we know. Now normally we wouldn't use WF in the deflection calculation. Remember we were tracking serviceability loads versus factored loads. Normally we would use our serviceability load case in uh, our, our deflection calculation. Length we know, E we know, I for a rectangle is BD cubed divided by 12 for a rectangle. So look at this, we have uh, and then delta is L divided by 360. So we actually have, um, we're going to work in millimeters here. We have 10,000 divided by 360 equals 5 times 50. Look at this. Let's multiply it by 1,000 to switch it to newtons and divide it by a thousand to switch it to millimeters. So it stays 50 kilonewtons per meter or newtons per millimeter. L is 10,000 to the power of four divided by 384 times 200,000 times our I is B 50 times d cubed divided by 12. Wowzers, that's a pain in the butt. We're going to have to do some crazy rearranging here. Okay, so we take this over here, uh, uh, and then we multiply out by the 12. So d is going to equal the cube root of, um, we're going to be multiplying out by our 12 times our 5 times our 50 times our 10,000 to the power of 4, uh, also times 360 divided by our 10,000 times our 384 times our 200,000 and I and times R50. So that's going to stay here. Yeah, my pen looks like it's slowly dying. Let's see if we can plug this in our calculator right. I would normally recommend breaking this into steps. And in the example uh, in, the, in the slides, I do break it up into steps. So let's plug this into the calculator and see if I manage to do this and, and rearrange this while listening to my child scream um, properly. Okay, so 3 cubed root, 12 times 5 times 50 times 10,000 to the power of 4 times 360 divided by 10,000 times 384 times 200,000 
times 50, bracket, bracket. Haha, I did it right. Uh, we get <clears throat> 655 millimeters. Okay, so uh, to meet our strength requirements that we uh, not go over 270 MPA, we need a beam that is 527 millimeters deep. To meet our stiffness requirements, we need a beam that doesn't go over 655 millimeters. So we have two different requirements. Which depth do we use? Yeah, this one, because we need one that works for both of these things. 527 um, uh, is less than this 655. So 527 wouldn't meet our strain requirements, but 655 would meet our stress requirements. All right, here is where I'm going to blow your mind or at least tell you one of the biggest takeaways you can take um, from this course. If you go out in the world when you're designing buildings and you're trying to work with your team and you need to make changes to your building to make things work or make adjustments, the things that have the biggest impact on the structural design are length and depth. That's the thing that you can change most. I mean, you could change your material completely, but we're talking about within the scope of a set project. Let's take a look at this. Okay, our length equations had um, WL squared divided by eight for strength and for serviceability, we had five WL to the power of four. So our load is linear, but our L is uh, to the power of two. For deflection, our load is linear. So double the load, double your deflection. But double your length, and you're increasing your deflection by a power of four. So, or you're increasing, like your length is to the power of four. So it is not linear. The impact of length on your design is not linear. So L squared for strength and L to the power of four for serviceability. For depth, strength, it's BD squared divided by six. And for serviceability, it's BD cubed divided by 12. So for strength, D is squared. And for serviceability, D is cubed. These are not linear relationships. So the biggest impact you can make on your design is to change length or depth. Whether it's for the negative or positive, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, those are the ones that are going to have the biggest impact. So what does that mean? <clears throat> if something doesn't work, the easiest way you can make a change is to shorten the beam or increase the depth. Uh, if you make the beam wider, it will have an impact, but it's linear. Because look, in both of these, B is a linear change. Double the width and you double uh, your I, but double your depth and you have a huge increase on I. So a big takeaway, and I already put this in the slides, deformation and strength are related for each material and we have data on most materials when they're in a normal range of behavior. There are section properties that allow us to calculate strength and deformation of shapes. We combine our knowledge of the shape and of the material we're using and we can design members to a certain strength and deformation. Here are your takeaways. Forever tips, you should understand that there's elastic and plastic behavior, where and how to calculate section properties, which I'm not really gonna make you do except for a rectangle, uh, that length and depth can have the biggest impact on the design. That is a huge takeaway. Like that is something that if you need to make a change when you're uh, working in your career 20 years from now and you need to make something just isn't working um, but you can't reduce your load, um, shorten the span by a tiny little bit. If you can, that's gonna have a big impact. Increase your depth by a tiny little bit. When I tell people often that they need to deepen their beam um, and they're like, oh, well, can't we just widen it instead? And I have to explain that widening it will do very little. It'll have a linear impact. 
it will help. But usually, if I say we need to deepen it by 50 millimeters, they say, can't we widen it by 50 millimeters? But those are not the same thing. They do not have the same impact. If I need it to be 50 millimeters deeper, I would need it to be much, much wider. All right. Stress and strain and modulus is last. As you should understand stress and strain and modulus of elasticity, their equations and how they relate to each other. I've given you those equations a few times. We sometimes show stress in 2D. Just understand B goes into the pain, plane, page. Plain sections remain plain. So strain has to vary linearly from the neutral axis. So stress also has to vary linearly from the neutral axis. Elastic and plastic stress profiles for a rectangle, we derived them. Uh, equations, we derived for S, Z, and I of a rectangle. Um, you can look up the other ones. You know, should know how to find, but we could also calculate S, Z, and I of other shapes. So you could derive these for all the other shapes, but you don't have to. Rectangle is the only one you need to know. Um, uh, but you can look up all the rest. And even for some, you can look it up, uh, even if they're a rectangle. So we're going to do a lot of examples going forward because, as always, this is the simple version of it. It's going to get a little bit harder. But as it gets a little bit harder, we also start to simplify some things. So you're going to start to see that as next week, you're going to see some weird equations. And you're going to be like, what are you doing to us, Shannon? But don't worry, the same basic principle is there, that for axial loads, our, uh, our force equals stress times area. Um, and for bending loads, our moment equals stress times S, or our shape property. So uh, we're going to just take that basic principle and add in some things that we know happen, like columns try to buckle and beams have lateral torsional buckling on them but otherwise that's the basic principle so we've gone through a bunch of examples here again i would not be offended if you look up other problems to do online i'm not allowed to share them with you because those are proprietary by other people but a lot of them are out there the same way i don't mind if someone looks up mine and does mine so go crazy if you need more examples go ahead most people do just fine in this course using the examples I've already provided. Okay, so uh, we'll see you next week where we start to actually get real answers. It looked like we got answers today, but not really. Next week, we will know how to fully design a steel column. We will have our first member that fully works where our reduced capacity is greater than our factored load, and we can say check in a box, we have a member that works. So I'll see you guys next week.